Good afternoon and welcome to WIDA's eighth and final interview with candidates to be Director General of the WTO. Today we're pleased to welcome Ambassador Tudor Ulyanovsky, Moldova's candidate to be Director General of the WTO. Thank you for joining us, Tudor, from Moldova. You're our first guest from your country on the WIDA platform. We're delighted to have you. Uh, before we get into today's event, we want to highlight several events that we have coming up in the next few weeks. Next Thursday, September 3rd, we are hosting the heads of the Aluminum Associations of the United States and Canada to discuss President Trump's recent actions to reimpose tariffs on imports of Canadian aluminum. The following week, we have two events. First, an interview with Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy of Florida on September 9th. And on Thursday, September 10th, we have a very special event with Pascal Lamy, the former Director General of the WTO, and Bob Zellick, the former US Trade Representative and President of the World Bank. We hope you'll join us for those events, as well as our intensive trade seminar, which takes place this year over three days, September 18, 21, and 22. We have a fantastic roster of speakers lined up to talk about how US trade policy is made and some of the key issues face, facing uh, trade policymakers in the US and around the world. Information on those and other events is available on our website, www.wida.org. For today's event, we like to highlight some of the people you're in community with watching the event on Zoom today. So special shout out to Caitlin Bast with the World Trade Center of Kansas City, Edna Ramirez with the Universidad of Guadalajara, Ambassador Francisco Campbell of Nicaragua, and Ji Lin from the Chinese Mission to the WTO. Thank you, Caitlin, Edna, Francisco, and Ji for joining us today. If you're watching this on Zoom, you have the ability to ask questions using the Q&A tab. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible after a discussion among our guests. Today, we're pleased to be joined by my good friends, Rufus Yerksa, the president of the National Foreign Trade Council and a former deputy director general of the WTO, and Wendy Cutler, the Asia Society Policy Institute, and for 30 year, over 30 years, one of America's leading trade negotiators. They'll be leading the discussion with our distinguished guest, Ambassador Tudor, Tudor Ulyanovsky, the former Moldovan ambassador to the WTO and candidate for the post of Director General of the WTO. Tudor previously served as Moldova's Minister of Foreign Affairs and as Moldova's top diplomat in Geneva, serving as ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein, their permanent representatives to the UN in Geneva and the permanent representative to the World Trade Organization. Quite a busy portfolio, Tudor. Uh, we're delighted for you're making the time to join us today. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Rufus. Well, thank you very much, Ken, uh, and to you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Tudor, it's, very, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, you're, the, you're the last of eight candidates to be on our program, but certainly not the least, and we're looking forward to, to your uh, presentation and to some give and take with, with this uh, worldwide audience. Uh, you know, Wendy and I, we, we've now been through seven of these, so we sort of, you know, some of the questions um, we'll, we'll be asking you might seem, seem sort of stale to us, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of them before, but um, I'm sure that your answers will, will help our audience uh, know you better. So, yeah, Wendy, uh, thanks for joining me again on this. Uh, gee, I don't know what you and I are going to do now that uh, Ken's run out of people for us to interview. Uh, maybe we need to get countries to uh, nominate more people, but I'm not sure Tudor would, would appreciate that. So anyway, Wendy, thank you for, for being here. Why don't we start with you, Mr. Minister, to, uh, to give our audience an appreciation of your candidacy, sort of an opening statement, and then we'll, we'll go on to questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rufus, uh, Ken, Wendy, thank you so much for, for having me today. Uh, and it's a great uh, opportunity, but also a great honor to address uh, your good selves, but also the larger audience. I see that there is a big uh, number of, of people watching, and I think that is very encouraging because there is a strong interest uh, with regards to the fate of the WTO, where are we all going? And uh, I think that's, uh, that's a good sign of the concern, but also the right motivation that we have to move uh, forward. And uh, from my end, uh, I believe I do have the right motivation to uh, start getting things done within the organization. 
uh, by means of applying the experience that I have accumulated over the years. And that includes, of course, the uh, experience as the ambassador at our in Geneva at WTO. And in that capacity, particularly, I have been engaged in uh, various committees of WTO, and that includes uh, the Balance of Payments Committee. And there was an, an uh, unfinished issue there for the past uh, four years, uh, which I managed to, uh, to negotiate and to a successful resolution in about four months, uh, which was appreciated by the membership as well. I was one of the four Geneva-based uh, ambassadors facilitators for the preamble of the ministerial declaration uh, for the Buenos Aires uh, ministerial conference. Uh, of course, there was no ministerial uh, final statement or uh, at the Buenos Aires WTO ministerial, but that was a good experience of, of uh, starting to, uh, to facilitate and, and to hopefully get a language accepted by, by, the, by the majority and eventually by, by everyone. Uh, and from that point of view, I have been particularly uh, engaged in conversations on the current, on the ongoing, and uh, negotiations within WTO and uh, on the major issues, on the more systemic issues, but also on the details in the uh, in the uh, some of the negotiations and of course uh, on the larger scale i have been uh, involved in political dialogue in my next capacity as the foreign minister of moldova in that uh, in that capacity i had particular opportunity to engage with the decision makers in major capitals uh, including washington beijing brussels uh, uh, Paris, Berlin, uh, but also uh, countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia Pacific. Uh, and from that perspective, I, uh, I realized that uh, uh, to get things done or to start moving uh, things within the organization, which include also the uh, uh, getting the right political will uh, to uh, initiate to, or to reinitiate, to reignite the engine of the organization, there is a need for this mix of uh, capacities, both political, but also technical uh, knowledge and political experience uh, for the next DG with the right motivation, uh, with uh, the fact that the initial actions should be also focused on uh, getting reaching out to the decision makers in the major capitals uh, with a view to get the right will so that the instructions will fly into Geneva and the negotiations will, uh, or the negotiators will get a renewed mandate. Uh, of course, uh, that is uh, easier said than done, having in mind the current uh, challenges that the organization is facing. Uh, I would see this moment sort of as a Hamiltonian moment for the organization, hopefully an existential moment, which can generate new approaches, but also uh, innovative ideas on how to tackle the, uh, the, uh, the issues. And of course, uh, in, from that perspective, I believe that uh, it's a priority uh, also in the context of the negative impact of COVID-19, uh, not only to the medical situation or to the health situation of the humanity, but also on the larger financial impact uh, on, the, uh, on the economies. And of course, particularly those that are more exposed, such as the SVEs, the small and vulnerable economies, but also LDCs and some of the developing members as well. And uh, from that point of view, I think WTO needs to increase its, uh, its uh, interagency dialogue and cooperation with other organizations, WHO, FAO, to include or to make sure that the global value chains, especially in agriculture and medical supplies, are, are, uh, are, are enhanced and further developed and facilitated. And from that point of view, I do not believe that WTO lives or can uh, allow itself to live in a vacuum, especially today. So there is a strong need to work with other agencies and WTO, I think today is more relevant than ever. Uh, of course, it is a member driven organization. So at the end of the day, it is members who would need to engage into negotiations and to uh, accept or to have uh, uh, hopefully uh, a renewed mandate to negotiate. And uh, I believe that a able, political experience and uh, uh, a diplomatically uh, active DG can move things forward. Uh, 
We can also focus on the issue of uh, addressing the, uh, the label lack of trust within the organization, which is also, I think, uh, more of a psychological uh, current situation, which has been built uh, in the context of the unfinished business on the negotiations that have not uh, achieved any result. Uh, on the issues, larger complicated issues within the organization, such as the SDT, the SND uh, principle, but also the uh, dispute settlement situation. And from that point of view, in my capacity as uh, a, a, a neutral candidate coming from a neutral country, uh, and uh, I have been uh, involved uh, in working with all the uh, members of WTO, and uh, I can speak with anyone across the table. Uh, having in mind my experience in Geneva also from the UN, and I was the president of Trade and Development Board of UNCTAD, uh, in which capacity I had uh, been uh, closely working with LDCs, with some of the developing uh, members from various parts of the world, and I was able to understand their concerns, their systemic concerns uh, in the context of the uh, not only COVID-19, but also with the larger trade uh, issues. So uh, I think that it's a very good uh, moment for the organization to have a distinguished uh, batch of candidates. And I uh, look forward for the conversation today and I'm encouraged by the interest for, uh, for, uh, for these talks and uh, let's uh, discuss these issues. Back to you, Rufus. Well, thank you very much for that overview, Tudor. And let me, let me start with, uh, a broad question. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a Hamiltonian moment. Uh, we, we've had a lot of uh, people, not just in the US, but around the world who, who have suggested that, um, you know, there is an existential crisis in the system and that <clears throat> if it doesn't find a way to proceed forward on all fronts, on the negotiating front, on um, the dispute settlement system on implementation of existing agreements, <clears throat> it will continue to drift towards greater irrelevancy, the, the WTO system will. And so, you know, obviously a lot of people are hinging hopes on a reform agenda, uh, but, um, you know, what that reform agenda will be is still very hard for us to appreciate, uh, you know, very differing positions from major players. If you see Ambassador Lighthizer's most recent uh, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, it seems to suggest a complete revamp of the WTO system, not just with respect to tariffs, but with respect to the dispute settlement system, maybe moving back to something prior to the WTO system. Um, very different positions about those issues coming from, from China or even from European Union and certainly from a lot of developing countries. So I'm wondering from your perspective, first of all, how important do you think it is to find consensus on a, a path forward on a real meaningful reform agenda? And how do you think you as a director general can help influence these major players who are currently at cross purposes with each other on a lot of these issues? How can you convince them to uh, to settle on a, on a common agenda. Well, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question, uh, Rufus. And uh, well, for, first of all, I, uh, I believe, and based on the conversations that I had so far with, uh, with WTO members, uh, that a reform of WTO is absolutely necessary. And in my opinion, a, uh, a cosmetic reform is not enough at this point. And that has been highlighted by the position expressed by uh, major players within the organization and within the uh, multilateral trade. And from that point of view, I think that uh, that should be also the, the starting point to get to the dialogue. And that from, uh, from that perspective, I think that the political experience and political context uh, will be absolutely or utmost important uh, first actions for the next DG uh, to engage in a political dialogue and to invite uh, those that have put forward proposals on the, on the reform process uh, to get into a dialogue and to start uh, a discussion, a comprehensive discussion, an inclusive and a transparent discussion where all members feel and 
uh, included and uh, are, are feeling that they are a part of the table. And uh, because the current situation, of course, uh, besides the, the US-China relationship uh, also is uh, or impacting the larger WTO system from the systemic perspective and the issues perspective. So uh, not only the uh, dispute settlement system and uh, the, the concerns expressed by the American delegation in Geneva uh, on, the, on the current state of affairs and the more technical issues, the more existential issues of the system, uh, but also the actions that the European Union had put forward with the MPIA and, and others. Uh, I think that uh, we also have to address a larger issue, a horizontal systemic issue of the organization that relates to the special and differential treatment. And from that point of view, I think that in principle, there is an understanding that this principle, that this, uh, this principle is at the core, at the foundation of the organization, but it's how you apply and uh, uh, what these principle, uh, how this principle determines the commitments of members. So it's also about the commitments uh, in the ongoing negotiations. And from that point of view, I think that uh, uh, from one hand, it is, or I see as a positive signal that the, uh, the major players or the major members are putting forward proposals. And uh, this should be a starting point for discussions. Uh, it would have been much worse if there was no proposal or no concerns put at the table. So from that point of view, I think that uh, I would uh, invite the, uh, everyone at the table, but especially those that have put this proposal forward uh, to start the dialogue and uh, hopefully to get uh, a mechanism on agree on how to proceed with this mechanism. Uh, even if fully understanding that for that, you would need to have the political will, number one. Number two, you would need to agree on how to proceed and uh, of course, I think that I would encourage a dialogue that will lead to a, 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 a solution that members will agree that this is how we are going to do uh, in the future. So from that point of view, I think that just a mere discussion or, uh, or, or uh, not looking at the issue from the existential point of view is also dangerous for the organization. So. Uh, Having in mind the fact that at this point uh, uh, th there are proposals put on the table and we had, of course, uh, on the DISP settlement, we had the proposals from the JC chair, uh, Ambassador Walker, uh, that have prepared some, uh, some views. We will have to see how far or how deep the reform will take will, will be, but we will have to have a reform. Well, thank you very much, Tudor. And, and from me, I just wanted to welcome you to our forum. And as Rufus said, you may be the eighth candidate we're interviewing, um, but we're thrilled to have you here and um, we look forward to this discussion. Um, you had mentioned a few minutes ago about your work um, with respect to the last ministerial in Buenos Aires about working on the preamble. For the new DG, they're gonna be facing um, an upcoming ministerial meeting, perhaps as early as June. And I think my question for you would be, if you were to become DG, what would be your priorities for that meeting? Um, and how would you define success? Well, thank you, Wendy, for this question. And I think that at least at this point, uh, the next ministerial uh, is a clear timeline uh, that we have to focus, we meaning the members of WTO. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, the next ministerial is extremely important to show some elements, some results. And the immediate result that I see at this point uh, is the ongoing negotiations on the fisheries subsidies. And that is also an obligation under the uh, uh, UN 2030 agenda as the G14.6. And according to my understanding, we are very close to getting a language that is accepted. So uh, a common language to be approved at the next ministerial, I think would be uh, an extraordinary result, fully understanding that this language uh, is not 
an end in itself, and it's only a first step in dealing with the larger issue of uh, IUUs uh, and uh, the larger issue of fisheries subsidies and development and so forth. At the same time, I would also focus the attention of the uh, members on the ongoing joint initiatives and the, uh, the negotiations in the plurilateral format. And here I'm referring, of course, to the uh, discussions on digital trade, on e-commerce. And uh, I, uh, I think that's something that we have to build on, especially in the context of COVID-19, that has highlighted the importance of, uh, of uh, having a more direct hands-on discussion on digital trade, on digital economy, uh, capacity building on the local level, uh, on the ground in the LDCs and some of the developing members. And from that point of view, I think that uh, more uh, detailed discussion discussion on issues of intellectual property, data protection, cybersecurity. But I, as far as I understand, there is a uh, stronger and stronger uh, input uh, for, for, for e-commerce. And uh, uh, a ministerial statement on, on, on that would be uh, one of the expected, in my opinion, results. Uh, some of the other joint initiatives, uh, such as uh, domestic regulation in services, investment facilitation uh, for development, but also having a language, even if at this point it's not a negotiation, it's a working party on SMEs and MISMEs, I think that a, the next ministerial is also a good opportunity uh, to have a clear message of support uh, for the small, medium uh, and, and micro uh, enterprises. Because at this point, uh, because of the financial crisis, uh, there is a risk or the most exposed are SMEs and the vast majority of WTO members have more than 90, 95% of their companies are SMEs. So uh, helping them and making sure that uh, because at this point, all the for, uh, prognosis or forecasts are showing that there is a risk for, for every fourth SME in, the, in, 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 the, in the WTO members to be, uh, to be closed or to go bankrupt. So that's, uh, I think it's a very important uh, target and a very important task. Uh, to, for the ministers to send a clear message of support, but also to focus on real ways on how to uh, empower them, either by means of working with financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, Financial Stability Board and others, but also working with ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, that I think is a, is a strong priority for WTO and it's also a good opportunity to work with the business community. At the same time, I think that COVID-19 should be dealt uh, at the next ministerial, either in the form of a larger political message uh, by, by ministers focusing on the trade issues. And of course, uh, in my opinion, sending a clear signal to the larger WTO membership that we would need to start negotiations or uh, to have a mechanism in place on how to deal from the trade perspective with the negative impact of COVID-19 and or uh, for future pandemics. And I think that it's a, it was a wake up call for the organization that we have to be uh, better prepared. Uh, at the same time, on the dispute settlement uh, understanding or the DSU uh, per se as a system, uh, I do not foresee a clear cut result or a, uh, an acceptance on the next structure of the judicial arm of the organization. But what I hope to achieve by that at least is a mechanism on how to approach this issue and to have either a list of issues, items on how we were to discuss, or at least a calendar of the next discussions and events. And uh, uh, last but not least, I think that a clear message, uh, which also was mentioned in Buenos Aires, is the issue of women empowerment. And for me, I, as a member of international gender champions, particularly this topic is of top, is of top importance. And as a foreign minister, I had uh, uh, pushed forward and promoted women uh, ambassadors and also within the organization. And I think it's very important to, to strive for parity within the secretariat of WTO. But also the next ministerial would be a good opportunity to have another ministerial declaration for women empowerment. And uh, uh, also, one of the results or one of the uh, tasks, let's call it uh, tactical steps for the next ministerial or by the next ministerial is to uh, optimize or to make sure and to capitalize the potential of the WTO secretariat to strive or to have a better understanding on how WTO secretariat can be more diverse, more representative of its members. 
and uh, and these would be uh, in my opinion some of the potential foreseen uh, outcomes of the next ministerial and i think that wto needs these uh, uh, incremental gains incremental check boxes to be to be ticked to show uh, to itself but also to the world that wto is able to deliver while fully understanding the fact that we will not resolve the larger systemic issues, but at least we are continuing to deliver and there are clear benefits for the community and for the business sector. Tudor, you, you, uh, you mentioned dispute settlement, you know, in the context of MC12, you, you, you said you don't expect, you know, a clear outcome there, but at least a, a, a some effort at defining what would be a, a process going forward. But it's becoming quite clear that, you know, if anything, the divergences are, are growing between um, certainly the, the Trump administration and some of our trading partners about this system. Uh, you know, I think a number of countries have shared the view that there, is a, there has been a problem with the appellate body um, jurisprudence and some issues of, of overreach and some need to, to address those. But now in this latest op-ed, op uh, Ambassador Lighthizer has even gone further than that and suggested that maybe we should go back to a system where we don't even really have an appellate body. Um, I mean, reading, reading what he was saying, it, it, it's to, to turn the system more into a kind of, a, um, you know, case specific ad hoc panel that is not really creating new law or, or solidifying the interpretations of the agreement, but merely helping the parties resolve the dispute, a, a, almost a sort of a commercial arbitration model. So it seems to me this is quite divergent from what um, the Europeans, for example, would like to see as an outcome. Uh, how do you see the role of the director general in getting people on board um, a real process? And do you think that it's realistic to go back to some earlier system where the appellate body didn't exist? Uh, well, th thank you, Rufus. Uh, I, I think that, well, first of all, um, having and putting things into perspective, uh, of course, we have seen the uh, uh, previously the American concerns or the US concerns presented to the General Council and to Geneva, uh, focusing on or reiterating some of the issues, uh, or the systemic principle issues of this settlement uh, system per se, and the appellate body particularly, uh, focusing more on the procedural or technical issues, such as the period of time for examining the cases, 60 days, 90 days, the mandate duration of the uh, of, of the judges, but also, of course, the larger issue of overreaching, uh, which has uh, has been expressed several times. And uh, I would not say that uh, uh, this is the uh, this opinion is only shared by the U.S. I think this opinion is has also been uh, shared by other uh, uh, important notable members of the organization. Uh, with with that in mind, uh, what I said and what I believe that for the WTO. Uh, is that it's a moment of, uh, of uh, interesting or it's a moment of putting forward different opinions. Uh, it doesn't mean that this opinion will, 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 will get approved because everything will have to be negotiated within the organization, including this mechanism, which I think uh, it should not be avoided. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, the role of the DG would be to put members together and allow different members to, uh, to present the details of their proposals and uh, fully understanding, in my case, fully understanding the, uh, a certain level of, of concern, of reservation, uh, but also, in my opinion, the role of the DG would be to encourage members to sit at the table and to discuss these issues. And uh, uh, of course, the recent op-ed that you are referring to is also another idea, another opinion put forward uh, with regards to identifying or in an effort to identify a solution to the problem. And the problem is that the, uh, the current uh, situation within the dispute settlement understanding and the dispute settlement system uh, has not proven beneficial to all WTO members. 
And uh, from that point of view, I, uh, I and I've spoken with, uh, with uh, of course, uh, uh, with, with the US, with China, with the European Union on the larger uh, perspective on how to deal with this uh, topic. And uh, I think that a conversation is needed. The DG is there to, to encourage members to put forward ideas, but also to provide good offices to try to encourage, constructively push, diplomatically push members to, to start talking about it. Uh, it. It doesn't mean that an idea that is put forward today will be accepted tomorrow, but an idea could also lead to other ideas. Uh, Having said, having said that, of course, we have uh, uh, seen uh, several uh, initiatives that includes the Article 25 of the DSU, the uh, interim arrangements and the MPIA and so forth, which is regulated uh, by, by, by the existing rules and regulations. And from that point of view, it's a temporary or interim uh, mechanism, which we'll have to see how that will be unfolded. But that doesn't have to, in my opinion, distract us distract us or, or take our attention from the larger issue that uh, we need to have a common understanding if we are to move forward. And uh, we will have to find, uh, and by we meaning the members, uh, we will have to find a sustainable solution. Because if it's only a one-sided solution or one-sided approach, and it's not accepted by others, it will not work in the future. So we'll have to make sure that one, we identify the the, the, the consensual solution. And at the same time, we will have to find, or at least as a DG, I would encourage to have a clear understanding on how we can uh, enable a compliance mechanism to make sure that the solution uh, works. Of course, uh, the decision will be taken by the members, uh, but I think that this uh, decision is, uh, is a top priority for the next DG to make an every effort to, uh, to discuss it to go into details and hopefully, hopefully to have a, a decision on how to move forward as fast as possible. Well, perhaps we can um, focus on US-China relations for a minute and how that impacts the WTO work because it does. And there are a lot of gaps between the US and the Chinese position on a whole range of issues that you've um, already, we've already um, touched on in this program. Um, Ambassador Lighthizer said when he um, looks at the criteria for selecting a DG, that he's looking for someone who recognizes that the current system just doesn't address Chinese trade practices and that changes need to be made. And what I would ask you, do you agree with his assessment, number one? Number two, there has been some work um, conducted by the US the EU and Japan on a number of issues with respect to non-market economies. Um, the initial work in the initial detail work focuses on industrial subsidies. And so my second question for you, would you support strengthening the WTO disciplines on industrial subsidies? And do you think this is a realistic um, objective? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, for uh, these important questions. And of course, the, uh, the larger issue of the relationship between the two biggest uh, uh, traders uh, of the world. I, I think that uh, that definitely is a topic of priority uh, for the next DG. Um, I Yeah, believe that the next DG could play the role uh, of providing the good offices to both uh, Washington and Beijing uh, to uh, meet together and to see and to have a conversation focusing or in the framework of the WTO rules and regulations. And uh, of course, it has to be consensual. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, and based on the conversations that I had with the larger WTO members and membership uh, from uh, LDCs and some of the developing members, uh, there was also a, uh, a, a request for the next DG uh, to raise awareness about the larger uh, systemic uh, spillover, potential spillover effects on, 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 on their economies and on their concerns, on their global value chains. So from that point of view, I think that the role of the DG would be to uh, ring the bell and to raise awareness uh, about the potential impact on the larger membership and on the larger um, mechanisms on trading goods and services. 
Uh, having said that, uh, that is also what I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that to, to, address these, uh, to address the US-China relationship, uh, there is a need for the organization to have a DG with political experience. Not to politicize the organization, because I think that the organization should be focused on trade negotiations. And, uh, but it needs a DG who will be able to protect as much as possible, not to politicize the, 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 the current uh, talks and negotiations within the organization. At the same time, a, an DG who understands the issue, but also has the political experience would be more capable to reach out to the decision makers, the highest decision makers, both in Washington and Beijing, and to raise awareness about the, uh, uh, the concerns of larger membership, but also to encourage uh, the two largest traders uh, to uh, sit down together at the table and to discuss those issues that they consider appropriate for the organization. And, uh, and having said that, I think on the, on the uh, larger issues that you have mentioned, such as the uh, industrial subsidies and other topics, and the trilateral um, initiative of the US, EU, and Japan uh, on, on market policies and, and, and so forth, I think that we need to have more in-depth discussion and conversation at the WTO uh, to have a better understanding on the issues and to have a more detailed uh, information uh, with regards to the current system and the current situation uh, with regards to this topic. And uh, we will have to see how far the organization will have to move with a view to create a more disciplined or, or, or a less disciplined approach uh, with regards to this issue. Of course, uh, one element from this is also the issues of uh, transparency and monitoring function of the organization, which in my opinion, I think is one of the, well, it, it is one of the three most important uh, roles of the, of, the, of the organization. And I think that an open, sincere dialogue might lead and hopefully will lead under a, a good guidance of the DG uh, to, a, to a better understanding and then based on that understanding to a better decision-making process on how to address these issues. You uh, made some reference earlier on to COVID and I, I wanted to turn a little bit to the pandemic and its impact on the trading system and the reaction of the WTO. Um, particularly, I, I think what I'm, what I'm thinking about is um, you know, we're all praying that this uh, is going to come to an end sooner rather than later, that the uh, combination of vaccine and other efforts to fight it will, will bring this pandemic to an end. And, and th then the question is, in a post-pandemic world where everybody's economy has is, is, uh, been badly impacted and they're trying to recover, how serious do you think the risk of... Um, protectionism and of unilateral measures by, by governments uh, in an effort to sort of buttress their own industries will be? And uh, what do you think the WTO system should be prepared to do in order to, to deal with that kind of a world? Well, that, that's a good question. And thank you, Rufus, for that. I think that, uh, uh, well, from the outset, I hope that COVID-19 will not last for a very long time, but of course, uh, that is something that is beyond our, our control, except that we have to follow some protocols. Uh, but with regards to the organization, and uh, we have to recognize the fact that COVID-19 was, was, was a wake-up call, was a shock to many uh, WTO members. And uh, from that perspective, on one hand, one can understand uh, the initial defense mechanism of, of certain uh, WTO members uh, with regards to their own uh, safety uh, based on the, on the sovereign obligation of the state to protect itself. Uh, at the same time, I think the role of the WTO is to make sure that on one first hand is that any such action uh, with a tent of protectionism uh, has to be followed uh, the notification mechanism to the secretariat. And uh, as far as I have been in contact with WTO secretariat, these notifications have been sent uh, to the secretariat uh, in, in quite, quite a good number. 
At the same time, I, uh, I of course, would like to raise awareness to the larger issue that any protectionist measure uh, taken within a certain jurisdiction uh, should not be, or should we should focus on the fact that it should not uh, disrupt the global value chains, particularly for medical supplies and those uh, uh, LDCs or developing members that are depending on some of the elements of these global value chains. At the same time, we have the issue of uh, agri agricultural and value chains. So from that point of view, I think that uh, on, on one hand, uh, I agree with you, uh, having an, talking about the, uh, a potential distorting uh, or protectionism measures or actions that have been taken by some of the WTO members. And uh, I think that it is the uh, one of the moral obligation of the DG is to raise awareness about the concerns that such actions uh, are raising. Number one. Number two is that we have to clearly understand the timeline or the time frame of, of such actions. And at the same time, I have, I'll be honest with you, I had so many conversations with uh, uh, WTO members from small and vulnerable economies that have, whose economy has been extraordinary hit by the uh, by the COVID-19, talking about the tourism uh, industry or actually uh, those exposed to the environmental uh, 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 danger, but also those that are heavily depending on, on trade in goods particularly, and uh, we have the landlocked developing uh, members as well. Uh, from this perspective, I think we uh, one opportunity is to focus on, on more digital trade and empowering more uh, uh, digital um, participation in the digital economy. And uh, from the larger systemic perspective, I think the issues of facilitation of trade are also important, and I think we need to address that. Uh, so uh, in, in, in a longer sustainable uh, situation, I think that effort should be taken to either to prevent or to make sure that there is no negative spillover effect of, of any regional and or domestic uh, action that uh, have a similarity to protectionism. If I could just follow up on that, I mean, the issue of onshoring and reshoring has, is, is an outgrowth now of um, COVID as well, that not just the United States, but other countries too, or, or, you know, have been exposed to the, their vulnerabilities in, um, during the COVID um, pandemic and feel that they you know, just didn't have a handle and didn't have adequate medical supplies and medicines. Do you think onshoring and reshoring is a, is a bad thing, wanting to bring the jobs back to your country and wanting, particularly in these critical and essential sectors, do you think it goes against WTO principles and how would you, you know, deal with a membership where some countries want to see kind of the free, the free operation of supply chains, while other countries kind of want to shorten them or regionalize them or even end them and bring everything home? Well, that's that's a, that's a very nice question, and thank you for that. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, actions should be taken to avoid such scenarios. At the same time, I think we have to. Uh, to, to, to make sure that uh, to have the real situation on the ground and to assess the real threat level for those members that are either don't have the capacity to produce or are not involved in the value chains developing the PPE or the medical supplies and to really uh, target them as beneficiaries of, uh, of assistance. And from that point of view, I think that uh, that is the uh, the, the uh, very important uh, uh, task is to work together with other organizations, is to make sure that there is uh, enough support and assistance that uh, these equipment and medical supplies are provided to them. Having said that, of course, uh, uh, WTO's role is also about monitoring and transparency. And from that point of view, I count on the on the sufficient reasoning uh, within the leadership of those WTO members uh, that might have a tendency to uh, localize uh, uh, the, the production uh, or localize an important part of supply chain of medical supplies, uh, not to or to try to show re restraint, uh, having in mind the larger benefit for the uh, for, for the membership. 
uh, this would be definitely a case by case uh, matter to address. And it is extremely important that the uh, uh, notification or the information that is uh, provided from the local uh, level to the WTO Secretariat is uh, processed fast and analyzed and actions uh, will be uh, identified having in mind the current particular situation of the current particular member. Tudor, let me ask you just to go a little bit more to this role that you articulate of, of the Director General. You've talked a lot about the importance of Director General being exercising good offices and getting the governments to negotiate, but what about the public profile of the Director General uh, as a spokesperson for the whole system, that is as the voice of the system and of the principles and rules. How important do you think it is for a director general to be out talking to broader publics about why um, rules-based open trade is, is important to their national um, well-being? Because you know, so much of, as a former director general said, a lot about the WTO system is kind of counterintuitive to the average person. You know, I mean, when they hear that protectionism is bad, well, you say, well, I protect my family, I protect my home, why shouldn't I protect my country? So I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about would you see your public profile as being important and how would you exercise that role? Well, it's a very complex uh, question, but I think that a uh, strategic public uh, communication campaign is absolutely necessary for the organization. Uh, first of all, uh, in the context of the existing uh, concerns with regards to WTO relevance, and, and let, me, let me tell you, and of course you understand uh, better than many, many others, how complex uh, the, and technical uh, sometimes the organization could be. So there is a need to have a special, uh, special talent for transforming complex terms into labor terms with uh, and hoping to get an understanding and therefore support. Because many times, and I think that it's a, it's a very good point, something that you don't understand usually creates concern uh, and then you are less likely to support or approve of it. So from that point of view, I, I think that a refreshed uh, public uh, relations or public strategic public communication is absolutely necessary. However, I think that, and in my experience as, as a politician, as also as a foreign minister, it's also uh, not only what you say and how you say and to whom you say, but also is what you don't say all the time. And that is something I think is, is important for the DG to have in mind. And I believe that a DG with a political background will understand the importance of internal consultations with members uh, on, on the way forward on the strategy uh, before making statements or before taking action. So I think it's, it's, it's a fine balance between on one hand, raising awareness about the extraordinary important role of trade in the country's economic development, access to markets, uh, export, uh, and, and, and others uh, at the same time, and we, this will also raise the profile of the organization within the society. And let's, let's be honest that uh, the reach out today uh, following the digital transformation or the uh, fourth industrial revolution, uh, that is also a good opportunity for the DG and a tool that the DG needs to take to make sure that the, the, the message of a DG reaches out everyone. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task, but which has to be very clearly analyzed. You know, strategic communication, uh, I think, is, is a top priority for a person at this level. But at the same time, I think it is extremely important what we discussed earlier with Wendy on the, on the deliverables for the next ministerial is how you prepare the public opinion uh, with regards to the importance of the next ministerial and how you present the hopefully the positive results or outcomes for the next ministerial. So uh, from that point of view, I believe that a, a uh, communication is absolutely necessary uh, with the public, uh, adjusting the messages depending on the audience. At the same time, having a more sometimes a more introvert perspective, 
is also how the DG communicates with WTO members. And that's internal uh, communication, which is also, in my opinion, important. So I believe that you have touched upon a very strategic element of the work of the next Director General of WTO. So just a, a quick question. Um, some critics of your candidacy point your age and they say you're quite younger than a lot of the other um, candidates. Maybe you don't have the experience or maybe you've like many, many years where you can later in your career, you know, buy for the WTO job. Do you, how, how do you respond to these critics? Do you think your age works against you or for you in this race? Well, I would not look at them as, as critics. Uh, I would look at them as normal questions with regards to any, any candidate. Are you going to talk about the candidate's uh, country of origin or where is the, the is, or even if a candidate is coming from a, a country of origin that has a trade dispute with another WTO member, is that a moment of concern or, or, or critic? So I would not focus on that. I would really focus on the track record and in my case, I believe I have a good track record, uh, having achieved results and uh, have negotiating outcomes in those committees, in various committees that I have been active for, but also as president of bilateral uh, economic and trade commissions and regional trade commissions uh, of my country with other uh, regions as well, uh, which includes the European Union, but also uh, uh, China and US. And from that perspective, I think that uh, that should be seen as an advantage, uh, at least. Uh, and, and I think that uh, a renewed, a more dynamic, a more uh, active uh, organization is also a reflection of the activity uh, of the Director General. Uh, and from that point of view, I'll definitely uh, look of what is best for the organization. Uh, are we satisfied with the current state of affairs? Do we want things to change? Do we want somebody who has motivation to deliver and who has the energy to deliver? But also, of course, who has the knowledge uh, of the issues, but also how, uh, how to relate to uh, politicians and to the media. So that is something that, uh, that everyone has to analyze. At the same time, I do not see that business as usual, and uh, you can categorize uh, age uh, also in that part as business as usual, is no longer an option for the organization. The organization needs reform, needs a deep reform, and that is why I think that is, uh, that is also a part of the larger logic of change within the organization. I see our master of ceremonies reappearing magically. So Ken, please take it away. Hey, thank you, uh, Rufus. Thank you, Tudor, for your uh, very thoughtful um, questions. Um, I guess it, I actually have a, we have a couple questions that have come in from our audience and if anyone has any others to please submit them. Um, I'm gonna tie like three of them together though, if that's okay with you, because we only have just a few more minutes. So you mentioned that you thought that um, business as usual at the WTO uh, isn't, isn't viable anymore. Um, I think the first part of the question is what's changed? Uh, I think it's obvious in some ways and you've gotten to it in other ways, but I think it would just a good articulation of what's changed and why we need to change. And the next part goes to uh, a really, um, one of the things that's been happening in recent years because there hasn't been um, as vigorous a multilateral initiatives that we have seen in the past, uh, countries have been turning to plurilateral uh, uh, approaches, um, but that is, been stymied to some extent, stymied is maybe the, not the right word, but it's been impacted by the, the MFN principles that the WTO has. Um, so do you care to comment on sort of how have things changed? Um, and and if, if this plurilateral world is the direction we're headed, uh, do we need to rethink the MFN principles? Well, um... The fact that there, are, there have not been uh, you know, major negotiations within the organization and the current uh, concerns or critiques uh, by the larger media with regards to the organization, that it's, uh, there is lack of trust, uh, lack of, uh, of things being done within the organization, that uh, also is a, is a good uh, indicator of the fact that business as usual is not working or has not worked enough well for the organization. 
uh, that means that doesn't mean that you have to take everything out and you have you start to negotiate from scratch and then you open the Pandora box and then from that point of view I think it's also dangerous for the organization you'd have to have a very honest and clear assessment of what rules and regulations have not worked and to decide whether to start negotiations or new ones or to see how better implement the existing uh, rules maybe their implementation was not done to a a better extent so from that point of view I think that uh there there is a clear understanding that things have to change but also if there is an understanding that as it is today the things that are today how if they're moving in the same direction uh the organization is not responding to the uh 21st century challenges so i think that from this point of view i think that there is a need for existential psychological uh but also systemic change within the organization uh with regards to the uh, multilaterals uh, versus plurilaterals uh, of course, the only multilateral negotiation at this point, we have the fishery subsidies, uh, which I hope to have a, uh, a multilateral outcome before the next ministerial. Well, we hope that it's going to take place before the end of this year. At the same time, having in mind or in the context of the existing situation within the organization, when there is not so much trust, when there is not so much credibility uh, with the larger uh, impact of the organization and relevance, I think that we should strive from the bottom up perspective, having in mind the fact that plurilaterals uh, at this point are a reality within the organization. At least I would not, I would see uh, plurilateral negotiations as a good sign that there is a group of like-minded members that are concerned about a topic and, and are trying to negotiate and to uh, create rules for this topic. Of course, that every negotiation in plurilateral format has to be done in a transparent, inclusive approach. Uh, in my opinion, and uh, based on the conversations that I had with the larger membership of the organization, uh, there is a very large uh, support uh, in favor of keeping the MFN principle being applied to plurilaterals. Uh, this is something that I have heard from so many members, uh, especially in the, in the current in the current situation with COVID-19 and with the financial uh, uh, crisis. So uh, I would say that plurilaterals should be seen as a, as a good element of, uh, of the organization, that, it, that there are processes within the organization and there should be encouraged. Uh, of course, uh, other members should be fully aware and should fully, be fully benefiting for the outcomes of any plurilateral negotiation. Thank you uh, for that. Um, really appreciate your taking the time. I know it's late. I think there's a seven hour time difference between the Washington area, East Coast of the US and Moldova. So we, it's, it's early evening there for you. So we're grateful for your making the time. Rufus or Wendy, any final closing remarks? No, just to, to thank you, Mr. Minister, for a very candid and, and thoughtful presentation. Thank you, Ken, for allowing me and Wendy to participate in these eight uh, interviews. It's been fascinating and we wanna wish you and all the other candidates the very best for, your, for the upcoming uh, selection process. And I would just echo those comments and just say what an impressive slate of candidates, all eight of them. And thank you so yeah. much Tudor for joining us. Thank you, thank you Tudor. Thanks uh, Wendy and Rufus. Um, Tudor, I mentioned to you when we were speaking before that we've done over 30 of these since March. Um, I think uh, Wendy Rufus has been on almost every one of those, not maybe not all, but most of those. And I'm very grateful to both of you. We're gonna be shifting to our fall agenda shortly. May see a little less of Rufus and Wendy, but we're still gonna have both of you as regular participants. I know the trade community enjoys seeing you as well and the chance to stay connected. Tudor, I saw your hand up. Um, uh, certainly any, any thoughts you wanna share before we close? Yes, well, thank you so much, Ken, uh, Wendy, and Rufus. I think this was a very good conversation, and I'd like to thank everyone who has uh, attended this in the, in the online format. And that, I think, is a one more element and one more sign to the fact that the next DG, and I think WTO, needs to rely not only on its members and secretariat and politicians back in the capital, but also on the, on the intellectuals and negotiators such as yourself that are playing an extraordinary role for uh, raising the issues, but also coming with solutions based on the experience that you have. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, I, I think it was a good round of, of, uh, of interviews.
and I hope, I hope that more will come in the future. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Best of luck with your candidacy. Everybody watching, stay safe with COVID. If you're in the Texas or Louisiana area, please stay safe with uh, the hurricane coming your way. Um, everyone, thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Best of luck, Tudor, with your candidacy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.